stand face to face in your heart runs to win the race when you kneel and you know this is Well, hi there, I'm Doug Moss. I'm one of the pastors here at Pathfinder Church. I'm also very proud to be the executive director of St. John's School that we've been featuring so much in our worship today. Uh, and I'm glad that you're here with us because we're, uh, it's a timely topic for today and all the families that we have with us uh, because we're talking about relationships, but we're doing it in the context of Proverbs. See, Proverbs is not just a collection of, of ancient sayings of wisdom. We believe here that, that Proverbs is actually the user guide given to us by God himself. God who is the architect of creation, the engineer who knows how he built this place to work and to work well. And he's given us in Proverbs some of the tips and tricks that he knows that are what we need to build a well-crafted life. Uh, which is why, uh, if you are just joining us, we've been in kind of a challenge for the month of January. We've been inviting people to read a chapter of Proverbs every day this month because there are 31 days in January and there are 31 chapters in Proverbs. And so it works out really, really well. And so if you're just jumping in, don't feel like you need to catch up or make up lost ground or anything. Just start with today. You know, today's the, the 23rd. And so today you should read the 23rd chapter of, of Proverbs. And then tomorrow you should read chapter 24 uh, and, and so on. And what I think you'll find is that you're gonna find these, these tips and tricks from the creator himself that will help you and I craft better lives for ourselves and for the people in our sphere of influence. Uh, and, and so today I wanna call out one chapter in, in particular. It's a chapter that if you are joining us on the challenge, you will read later on this week. It's chapter 27. Uh, and, and it really hones in on, on one very important facet of our lives. We've talked uh, so far about um, in this series about how we use our words, how we use our wealth. Uh, but, but this week, Proverbs zooms in on this one thing that how do we build relationships? Uh, how do we have relationships different than, better than the people around us, relationships that will bless us and bless the world? Uh, and so I just want you to listen to Proverbs chapter 27 and just note some of the themes that you yourself might pick up as we read through it, okay? So Proverbs 27, here's what it says. It says, do not boast about tomorrow for you do not know what a day may bring. Let someone else praise you and not your own mouth, an outsider, not your own lips. Stone is heavy and sand a burden but a fool's provocation is heavier than both. Anger is cruel and fury overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy, right? As, as toxic as anger can be in a relationship, jealousy is even worse. And better is an open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. One who is full loathes honey from the comb, but to the hungry, even what is bitter tastes sweet. Like a bird that flees its nest is anyone who flees from home. Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart and the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice. Do not forsake your friend or a friend of your family and do not go to your relative's house when disaster strikes you. Better a neighbor nearby than a relative far away. Because as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So this is a very beautiful and powerful picture just painted, just even in these few short verses uh, of the kind of relationships that will see us through thick and thin, that will get us through good times and disaster. Uh, I thought it was so interesting. It, it calls out that in a moment of crisis, it's actually better to rely on your neighbor near you than, than a relative that might be far away. And, and that feels so foreign to me. I, I like my neighbors, they're good guys, uh, and I would definitely trust them to like, let my dog out if I, you know, if I was far away or something. I, I don't know that I'd want to turn to them first in a crisis. In fact, it, it would feel weird to me. And, and the more I look at Proverbs and the way it describes the relationships that you and I are encouraged to have, the more I compare it to my own life and realize I don't really have those kinds of relationships. And, and, and I don't think I'm that much of an outlier. I think most of us, don't have the kinds of relationships that lead to the well-built life. 
And as I look around, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. We're gonna talk about that. But what's interesting is that even though in real life I don't necessarily see this biblical picture of friendship and relationship the way, uh, the way we see in Proverbs, there is one very common area of life where I see it all the time where there's one place that really gets the biblical picture of relationship and the kind of friendship we should have. And you know where that is? TV sitcoms. <laughs> I mean, think about it. You look at these, you know, all these popular ones for the last few years, and all of them you see over and over again that there, are, there is the friend that sticks, through you, sticks by you through all of the vagaries of life, that no matter what, you know, that they're gonna be there nine seasons long. They're gonna be there beside you uh, and with you. And in, in the case of Big Bang Theory, maybe a few seasons too long, in my opinion. Uh, they could end that a little sooner. But it's this picture, right, that, that even if you get married, even when you get divorced, even when you, when you get jobs or lose jobs, there are these friends who are going to be by you through thick and thin. Uh, and it's this beautiful picture, and there's a reason why I think some of these shows have been so popular for so long, because it's a way uh, for us to get these things even when we don't necessarily have them in our own lives. That you can tune in and, and, and watch Chandler and Joey be best buds even if you don't necessarily feel like you've got that relationship yourself. I don't know about you, but my personal squad goal is from a TV show called Scrubs, and there are two best friends in Scrubs that is everything I would like in a best friend, uh, JD and Turk. And in fact, there's one, one kind of long scene uh, from an episode of Scrubs that, that really captures the, the power and the durability of this particular friendship between these two best friends. So let's talk, I like I'm going anywhere, right? Great, oh, thanks, okay. Excuse me. Turk's back from his honeymoon! Nice to meet you. Turk! Hi! Go ahead. Jenny! Maybe someday he'll love me like that. He's here! Turk! The newlyweds. Oh, and uh, hey, Carla. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Who, who wouldn't want someone that, that, that went to college with you and med school with you and, and, and followed through you for, with your career and that no matter what happened, you just knew that you were, you had each other's back, you were there all the time. And, and not just in the good times, I, I also see it that there's one other place I really see it represented well around us. It's when you're in war. When you're going through the hardest stuff, when you're facing the risk of death daily, that there is a reason why Band of Brothers and Saving Private Ryan and 1917, Dunkirk, all these movies, you see that when there is true threat around you, there is nothing, nothing more important than having uh, that person that you know is gonna be shoulder to shoulder with you that's gonna have your back in the, in the worst and toughest situations. That's why my, my other friendship goal besides JD and Turk is from Tombstone. You know, Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday, and that no matter what gunfight or no matter what challenge or threat was gonna be facing them, Doc Holliday was gonna stand by Wyatt to his dying day. Literally, as he was dying, he stood by his friend. And, and as I look at these moments that are so inspiring to me, aspirational for me, I see not only this, this wonderful playing out of this picture from the Bible, but it also just contrasts that I don't have someone like that. I didn't have someone that was so eager to see me when I got back from my honeymoon. I, I, don't, I don't have that person that if I had to go into a gunfight, I know that they would be there without my even asking. And, and so what is it that, that we need to understand differently. What can we learn from Proverbs and from the Bible as a whole uh, to figure out why that's missing from so many of our lives and what we could do to maybe start to get some of that back. 
And, and to get there, there's a biblical concept that I'd like to unpack with you. It's, it's one that, um, that we, don't, we don't talk about a lot these days, but it, it's throughout the scriptures, it's really, really important. Uh, and to get there, let me talk about kind of the spectrum uh, of relationships and how we understand the, the reason for relationships, what's the, what's the point of having relationships, uh, and, and what that means for us. See, there, there's kind of a spectrum uh, across societies in that what is the obligation or the duty of the relationships that we have? Is the point of them um, to bless and to benefit the community, or is the point of them to bless and benefit the individual? And you can probably, without a lot of effort, think about some examples on both sides of the spectrum, right? You look at some of the, the traditional, you know, ancient societies where everything was about um, the needs of, of the, the communal group, the tribe, the culture. Uh, you get married not because you love someone, you get married because you need stable families in which to raise children. You get married because you need kids uh, to help um, work the farm and do all the things that you need. Like, and the, the community needs marriage. Or you know, on the more individual side, you know, certainly Western, you know, modern side, you, why do you get married? You get married because that's what would bless me, that I, I'm gonna have um, the best life if I have a good supportive spouse who gets me and, and who helps, helps me accomplish my goals. The, the point of marriage is not for the, the community, it's for, it's for the blessing of the individual. And, and, and somewhere along this spectrum is where we're all gonna lie and where we're gonna have to find uh, an answer that, that fits. In fact, most human ethics, a lot of philosophy, this is literally the starting question about, about anything, is, which is what do we owe to each other? Do we owe just individual fulfillment or are we striving for the sake of community? Is, is it more important to have honor for the family, uh, to protect our tribe than it is our own individual needs and desires? And, and every society struggles with this, and, and uh, as you can probably, you wouldn't be shocked to hear, uh, as modern Americans, we definitely skew pretty heavily on the individual side of, of the equation. But we who trust and believe that there is a God who is for us, who's designed this whole creation, we actually uh, have a little bit of help in, in wrestling with this question, because for us, this is not simply a horizontal question about what are the needs and the obligations of relationship, that God actually brings this amazing vertical element into the picture. See, I believe this, that you and I don't actually have any relationship that's just between me and the other individual. It's not even between me and the society, that every relationship you and I have also has a divine element. In fact, it's God bringing in his divine energy to a relationship. That it's not just the energy that we humans bring, it's that God invests in the relationships that we have in a really powerful and profound way. And, and right here, kind of in the middle of the tension between, between the obligations of, of whether it's for community, for the individual, how God weighs in right here at, at the center of this is this biblical concept called covenant relationship. See, covenant relationship uh, is basically saying that, that you, are, you are committed in, in a deeply moral way to a relationship, that it's not just about my needs, what I'm getting out of the relationship, it's not even about like the needs of the community, what, what the community needs from my relationship, it's that God himself has imposed a value on this relationship, and so whatever the relationship needs is actually more important than what I might need or what the community around me might need. See, we see both ends of the spectrum are wrong. It's not all about the individual's needs, it's not all about the community's needs, it's the sweet spot where in our obligation to God and what God has invested in us, what does the relationship need? And how are we agents of God in every relationship that we have? See, and, and this is why covenant relationship is so powerful, so important, because these are the relationships that stand the test of time. These are the relationships that get you through being in a foxhole when the bombs are going off. These are the relationships uh, that mean that you don't get to the end of your life uh, alone and with no one uh, to support you or be with you. These are the relationships that the Bible describes over and over and over again, covenant relationships. Now, the temptation and what often happens is covenant relationships tend to, we tend to not strive for them, we settle for something that Timothy Keller describes as a consumer relationship. He says that the opposite, the contrast of a covenant relationship is a consumer relationship. Now, a consumer relationship, just like what we were talking about, is a relationship that what matters, the only thing that matters, is what I get out of it, because I am the consumer of the relationship. And, and Timothy Keller makes the point that for much of human history, the bulk of our relationships have been covenantal, but that there has been a shift, certainly in America, but in a lot of the West, that more and more of our relationships have been becoming consumer. 
And so again, a consumer relationship, there is no moral value to exiting that relationship. If I have a vendor that supplies something to me and I can find it somewhere else, you know, faster or better or cheaper, it's no moral hardship uh, for me to shift vendors because it's a consumer relationship. Same with the workplace. If I'm working for an employer and there's someone else who will pay me more for the work I'm doing, you should do that. Like that there's, because it's a consumer relationship, it's what you're gaining out of it is you're gaining uh, the ability to live and support yourself and so you can, you can get that somewhere else. But all of the other relationships for most of human history were covenant. Like you're the king, if you lived in a monarchy, which most human beings have over the bulk of history, then, then there was this belief in divine right of kings that you didn't just have an obligation to your king to be loyal to him, you had an obligation to God because God's the one that put that king in place, that designated that family to be the ruling family. And so you owed something not just to the king, but to the God who was behind the king. And in the same way, the king owed something to their subjects, that they, it, was, it wasn't for them to be tyrants or, or to use their power and their clout against the, the people in their land, that a king, because they were placed by God, had an obligation to lead their people well, to, to raise taxes for, for the good of all so that they could rule justly and fairly, so that they could pay the armies that they would need to protect their people, et cetera, et cetera, right? Both sides of it, king and subject, understood that it was a covenant relationship because it wasn't just between them, it was between them and God. Or church was a covenant relationship for most of history because you didn't have uh, the transportation and the internet the way we have now. Your community of faith was whichever one you could reach by a morning's worth of travel. It had to be close enough that you could walk there or that you could take the carriage there. And so you didn't have a lot of choices. For better or for worse, the church in your area was your church and you had to, had to just kind of soldier, soldier through life with them. And, and maybe there'd be gossip and there'd be drama and there'd, there'd be that one person that stole your potluck recipe or whatever, but you just had to deal with it because church was a covenant relationship. You know, family was the same, and we've talked spouses, weddings, marriages used to be a covenant relationship, uh, and, and more and more, uh, they're not. See, because what Timothy Keller says is that little by little, we have taken these covenant things and we have placed them in the consumer category. I mean, one of the things we, we brag about is as a modern democracy, right? The, the king is in a covenantal relationship. Like, we have government that we get to vote in. And if they provide us the benefits that we want out of our governmental leaders, then great. And if they don't provide us those benefits, we vote the bums out. That's, that's how democracy works. And so there's no moral value to replacing a, a senator or a president or anything like that because it's just a transactional. If they're not doing what I want of them, then I'm going to elect a new and hopefully better leader. Or, or church is the same way that, that so many of us now today, we, we choose a church based on where the better preaching is or, or where the, the better worship is. Uh, and when things go get, get messy, which they will, because a church is just a collection of sinful human beings trying to be in relationship with each other, there's not this covenantal burden to stay and, and work it out and figure out how to press through. It's simpler and easier to just try the next church down the road. Because after all, if we're in the consumer category, church is only uh, meaningful in my life as long as it blesses me. And if it's no longer helping me in my spiritual growth and my, my journey, then there's no moral value in stay, sticking with it. I should just find a new church, a better church. And this is definitely one of the things behind the, the increase in divorce in our country is that if, if a wedding is not a covenant between you and another person and God, if a wedding is just helping you be your best self, then the moment a spouse is, is, is not loving you the way you wanna be loved, uh, they're, they're not forwarding your goals or supporting you in, in the direction you wanna go, well, then you find a new wife, a better wife. Right? I mean, that's just how it, that's how, how it works. And, and, and Timothy Keller says, basically, we've gotten to this point now where almost all of our relationships are in the consumer category. In fact, there's really not much left over on the covenant side, except children. <sighs> and have you ever tried to cancel your Amazon Prime membership? It is impossible. I'm just telling you, if you have not tried, don't, because you you're gonna give up. But this is what we're left with, right? That, that there's really almost nothing left in society today. And this is non-Christians, this is Christians. We, we all have fallen into this. That at the end of the day, what, what's so fascinating is children. We all recognize, whether you're a believer, or not a believer, we recognize that there is something profound and deep about that child relationship that it is not consumer, because if it's consumer, none of us would have kids. Uh, there's not a, a blessing and a benefit of being parent to a newborn, right? Oh, so they, they, you're telling me they, they poop all day and they keep me up all night. Fantastic. 
That's, that sounds great for me. I'll sign up for that. No, there's a covenant there. You reckon, we recognize, again, those of us that are, that are believers recognize it as a gift from God, but even unbelievers recognize that there is something about the, the, the bond between you brought these people into this world. They didn't choose it. You owe them something. They have a demand on you that you can't break just because they might be holding you back from your best life, just because you might not be getting something out of that relationship. You owe something to them, you owe something to God. And, and the reason why this is such a troubling trend uh, is, is partly because it, it's built in just to the structures of our particular um, culture and our community. For all the benefits that, that a, a free market economy and capitalism might bring, they, they also bring a very stark consequence. Because the underlying value, that the deepest fundamental principle of our economy is, is profit, making the most return on your investment, getting the maximum value uh, out of the things in life, which includes your relationships. But what happens is it will ultimately commodify us. You and I just become one other thing that has an assigned net worth. And relationships become only wor worthwhile insofar as they bring worth. And so I'm only going to be a friend to someone as long as I'm charming enough in conversation, as long as I let them use my truck to move on the weekends, right? As long as I bring value, people will have friendship with me. And the moment I stop bringing value, they stop being friends. And, and, and you see it just all down the line. That at the end of the day, where this leaves all of us is that we only have relationship insofar as we bring value to the relationship. And that is a dangerous and scary place to be. Because there will be the days where you just don't have the scintillating conversation in you. There will be the days where you're down and depressed and sad and, and it's not fun to be around. There will be the, 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 not just the days, maybe the months and the years where your career trajectory, all, all the wealth that you thought you were gonna accumulate that was gonna set you up for success, it derails and you're not worth anything to anyone around you. There's not an employer that wants you to work for them and, and there's not anything you can do for the people around you this is an incredibly tenuous, uncertain place for all of us to be. And yet, this is where I think so many of us are when it comes to our relationships. Uh, it's certainly where I am. I mean, I think about this. I, I had five groomsmen on my wedding day, five men that stood up next to me the day I married my wife and said that, that they were gonna be in this with me uh, through thick and thin. I have not spoken to most of them in years. In fact, just one in the last like three, five years have, have I spoken with. Like these were the guys that I chose, that, that I knew the best, that, that I thought loved me the best, that I was committed to the most. And I just don't really even see them. Nothing went wrong. It's just, we got busy and we got different careers and we got, we got married to different people and, and, and just all these things happen. And, and now I find myself in this spot where the relationships I tend to have are ones where I bring value and worth to them. They're consumer relationships. But Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, they point out why this is such a tenuous place to be. Uh, Ecclesiastes is the sequel to Proverbs written by the same person, and he summarizes the problem this way. He says, look guys, two are better than one. First of all, because they have a good return for their labor. There's a synergy when people work together. They, they maximize uh, their profits, their efforts, everything they're gonna be able to do. But not only that, if either of them falls down, one of them can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You see, King Solomon, who wrote these Proverbs and wrote Ecclesiastes, he, he's learned and if you were here last week, you know, this is one of the wealthiest, most privileged guys ever. This was a ruler of an entire kingdom. This is a guy who, who could pay for every luxury he needed in life and could certainly pay for anything he needed to, to get through life. And yet he's saying, there's nothing like having someone that's actually with you. A man who could pay for all the bodyguards in the world is saying, I'd still rather have a friend to back me up in the hard moments, in the seasons of life. See, and this is where we come to a, a crossroads, you and me, because we actually live about as privileged of lives as Solomon. And we live at a time where there are, there are very few luxuries, certainly very few staples of life that we cannot acquire for ourselves. And so it is so tempting to just stay there. 
Like I don't, I don't need someone's help to mow my lawn even when I don't have time because I can just pay for a lawn mowing service, right? And it's so much easier, simpler, less messy. I don't have to make conversation with the guy. I just give him the money, he mows my lawn, we're done, right? Or you think about old age and what it's gonna look like to be supported. And, and I think it's so, it's, I, I get why it's happening, but I see why there's so many assisted living homes being built now because we would rather rely on someone we pay to take care of us in our old age than to rely on lifelong friends or family. See, having those kinds of relationships, it, it takes work, it takes investment uh, in a way that we're so tempted to short circuit by just simply paying for what we need, especially because many of us are in a spot where we can. Uh, and, and yet what we're doing is we're ultimately setting ourselves up for a much less certain way to live because at the end of the day, it still ultimately depends on the value that we can bring and that we can accumulate enough resources to pay for all those things the rest of our life. And yet we often might not be able to. You see, and Solomon says, it's not just about networking. It's not just about spreading, spreading wide and having 50 or 100 people in our, in our contact list. He, he says that what you really should be striving for is not just a lot of friends. You know, one who has a lot of friends, but they, maybe they're unreliable. They soon come to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You see, Solomon's saying that, that what we should be striving for, recognizing is that what we all need we need that, that relationship that's closer than a family relationship, that, that, that's beyond uh, just being able to pay for something, but that's someone that is there with you. See, and that's not only good advice for us to be striving for in our life, Solomon was also pointing ahead to us. He was actually making a future prophecy, saying that, that we all need a friend who sticks closer than a brother, and here's what I'm gonna tell you if you didn't know it. You and I, no matter what your earthly relationships might be, no matter what friendships you have or have not cultivated around you, you and I have a friend who is closer than a brother, who is stronger than you, and I, you are and I am, who has everything that we need to be, to have the kind of relationships the Bible says, and, and his name is Jesus. And in fact, this is the label Jesus gave himself in one of the last speeches he gave before his, his death, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. He said this to his disciples. He said, look, as God the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. So now remain in my love. And if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends, if you do what I command. See, I, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, a life that is well-crafted. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you, and this is my command, love each other. You see, this is the secret to having a covenantal relationship, is that we don't rely on our own ability and what we can bring or contribute to a relationship. We recognize that the one who has all things has already invested his full power, might, and blessing in us. You see, this covenant relationship picture, it, it starts actually with what God puts into the relationship, that he chooses you, he chooses me and not because we got anything out of it. See, this is the key. There, there are two things about the covenant relationship that we miss and is why we don't do them. The first is this, someone has to go first. Someone has to, when, when, when you're jockeying for, for figuring out what's our relationship look like, who are we gonna be, what are we gonna commit to each other, someone has to just be the one to say, you know what, I commit to you. I choose you. I'm gonna love you. And I'm gonna work for your good in life. Someone's gotta be the first one to say that. And what is so amazing and powerful is that God was the first one to say that. That he looked at you and me and all of our messiness, all of our broken, flawed ways of being, and he didn't say, what, what can human beings do for me? God said, let me do for you. Let me love you. Let me put my joy in you. And God went first and made a covenant with us one that he won't break. And here's the power of this. There is nothing that you and I can do either to be worth 
that relationship and there's nothing we can do to break that relationship because it wasn't up to us. It was up to God who chose us first. And so whenever anyone else may leave you, whenever everyone else may look at you and say, ah, you're not, you're not clever enough, interesting enough, fun enough, worth enough for me to be in a relationship with, God has never said that about you and will never. He just loves you because he committed to you. That picture of JD and Turk, you know, you know, grabbing each other in joy, that's the picture of God. His joy is in us. His joy is complete when he is with us. That's it. You're all that God wants at the end of the day. It's just to be with you, be your friend. He went first. But the second thing is this, is that it's hard for us to believe that truth about God unless we have seen it mirrored in the human relationships around us. That's why this chart is so important, is because if you have not experienced that kind of love somehow, somewhere in your earthly relationships, you will not be able to believe it from God. See, this is why God uses language, like, like he, he makes a metaphor that he's like a heavenly father, because his intent is that you will have had good fathers, good mothers, people that have made a covenantal commitment to you as their child, and that when you hear God say, oh, I'm a good father, you'll connect that because you had a parent who loved you covenantly, unconditionally, and you'll say, oh, that's what God must be like. But I, I've been saddened to know people that they didn't have fathers or mothers who loved them. And what, what I've observed in them is that this doesn't land. You tell someone that God is a loving father and they compare God to their real father or their real mother and they go, well, that's bogus. That doesn't make any sense at all. And see, this is why this is such an important tension because we have to see it somewhere in a human being before we'll believe it about God. And so here's what I would, would give you today is that I invite you to cast your mind and I hope that somewhere in your life, you have had a human being. And, and hopefully it was a parent, but if not, maybe it was a coach or a mentor or just a really great friend. Someone that loved you unconditionally, someone that loved you with a covenantal relationship and that you can lean on that memory, even if they're not currently in your life or especially if they still are, to lean on that and go, oh, that's just a glimpse. That's just a tiny little taste of how fully and unconditionally God loves me. And so I pray that you've got that person in your life. And if you have not, then I would commend to you. I would strongly recommend it. If you have had no one that's loved you like that, no human being that's been that person for you, then I'd ask you to reach out to a Christian therapist or a counselor because that's one of the things they can do so well is they can be that person that models that unconditional love of God to you. And once you've had it, once you've tasted it, once you, you've seen it play out, here's what it will do. I promise you, it will start to change the way you invest in your relationships with the people around you. See, I'll tell you this. I haven't actually gotten to see it myself yet. I don't have a Turk or a JD, but my wife does. And I tell you, it was this amazing thing. It was just a coworker of hers. It was someone we knew a little bit, uh, and they'd been, been becoming friends. And then we had our first baby, and it was rough. And this friend of my wife's, unasked, she was living 10 states away, she just flew out and she just moved in with us for like two weeks. And, and we, didn't, we didn't ask her to do that. There wasn't a burden that, that we had put on her. She just saw our needs, saw that we were struggling, and out of her own love and commitment to us, she just poured in. And for two weeks, she maintained our sanity. And she waited till she was like, sure that we were okay. And then she's like, all right, I think I can go back now because we were not okay. We needed her in that moment. And that was the first glimpse I'd ever gotten of what it could be to have a ride or die friend, to have someone that, that wouldn't ask for anything in return, just was committed to blessing me, taking care of me and my family. And I'm so grateful for that. And what's been amazing is that, is that in, or in the years since, we've been able to pay that favor back to her too. And, and it's cre created something that has not broken ever since. But until I saw it in a human being, I was never able to actually grasp what God had done for me. See, we need both things. We need human beings to give us a glimpse and a mirror of who God is, and we need God to give us all of, the, all of his energy so that we can pay it out into other human beings. See, here's what I'd ask you to do if, if you have even a glimpse of the goodness of God, is for you to look around at your relationships and, and see who it is that maybe you have an opportunity to go first. Who is it, whether it's a, it's a friend, a coworker, a spouse, 
Someone that, that you are in a spot to say, because God has loved me so fully, because I feel how he has poured out everything he has for me, I don't need anything back from you right now. But I just want you to know that I'm committed to you. I'm gonna serve you. If, if there's a thing that you need that I can provide, I want to be the one to provide it. And so maybe that does look like reaching out to a friend that, that, you, that you're ready to really go to the next level with. Maybe it means reaching out to your spouse and saying, hey, I know things have been rough between us lately, but I want you to know that, that because of how God has committed to me and chosen me and given me his joy, I wanna commit to you, even if you don't give me anything back. Or maybe it's being a, a boss and reaching out to an employee and taking something that is a consumer relationship and making it something better, saying, hey, I'm, I'm committed to investing in you. I wanna help you be the best version of yourself that you can be. So if that's training or resources or support, if there's a way that I can bless you so that you can thrive into the person God wanted you to be, even if that's not for me or for my company, even if it's just to send you out into the world to be better somewhere else, I want to make that investment, that commitment in you. See, you and I, as friends of Jesus, he empowers us to spread that kind of covenant relationship, that, that unconditional investment in others. He calls us to spread it to the world. And because we have all of God's goodness, we actually are equipped. We have the divine power to make that kind of a difference in the lives of people around us. So as you're reading Proverbs this week, and I hope that you will, I, I hope you've gotten some of the framework that as you're reading some of these parables about how we should be friends, what kind of relationships we should have, that you'll recognize the underlying framework behind them, that it's because God himself created a covenant relationship for us to have with him. And he knows that you and I will have the best life when we intentionally invest in others in that same way that he's invested with us, that we'll make their lives better and we will ultimately reap a harvest tenfold when we're willing to create those covenant relationships with people around us as well. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Lord God, I'm just so grateful to you that you went first that you looked at us and you, you, didn't, you didn't demand anything of us, you didn't, you didn't ask for anything, you, you just poured out your own love and goodness on us. You conquered death for our sake. You showed us love since you knew that we needed human beings to reinforce it, you became a human being yourself so that you could just love people and give them a taste of how much the Father loves them too. And so Lord, I pray that that love would, would, would settle deeply into our hearts pray that we would feel how much you have committed to us, that your relationship with us is unconditional. It will never break, it will never be shaken. And Lord, I pray that then out of the fullness of that truth that you would use us to be a blessing to others, that you would empower us here to take, take a first step, maybe with just one person, to make that first choice that is the beginning of true covenant relationships that will last a lifetime and that will last into eternity. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in and being with us as we dug into some awesome relationship content today. Um, thank you for also just being a part of our online Pathfinder community. We love that we have that community built online. I uh, want to encourage you to visit, visit our website for helpful links. You can go to pathfinderstl.org and find all sorts of stuff that can benefit you and help you along on your life journey. Also, while you're there, make sure you check out the Pathfinder Message podcast. Anytime you're on the go, it's a great way to look back on old messages or hear some of the most recent ones. Love for you to like, share, and comment on this video. Um, that helps spread our reach. And we also just love hearing from you. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hope you have an awesome week.